All right, good morning. Man, we're, we're leaning to the left, pulling to the left today. Wow. Uh, they really love you, I promise, you know. It's like, eh, anyway. Awesome. It's great to see. Wow, it's so weird. It's so cool. All right, well, awesome. Uh, hey, I just want to say welcome. Glad you're watching online as well. Glad you're joining us. Uh, had a, just a crazy week. Lots of stuff going on in our lives. Just craziness. Uh, and I forgot to tell our earlier service, I can't believe I didn't share, that uh, I'm a grandpa again. Uh, I'm excited about that. Yeah, Annie, Annie had her baby, and uh, so it's, it's Joanna Rose Samaniego. She was 10 pounds. Yeah, can you believe it? I'm telling you, like a pound and a half was her hair. A hair alone. I'm not kidding. I mean, just a head full of hair had to weigh a couple pounds. I mean, seriously. Uh, and so, yeah, everybody's fine. Everybody's good. And so we're just so excited about that. So a lot of, a lot of change, a lot of, a lot of newness. Uh, and so uh, it's exciting, too. I don't know if you heard, too, but uh, Maddie, right, is going to have a boy. We found out. So uh, anyway, my my uh, uh, dad is very excited about that. All right, uh, he he kind of likes the the guy things going on, so he's he's pumped. And so of course we all are. We're really excited, and and uh, good things. Uh, God is so good, isn't he? He really is, and uh, just pumped about just lots of stuff going on. As as you know, I've been you know pouring through this this passage, and and we're in Colossians, by the way. It's obviously you can tell by the bumper. Uh, if you haven't been with us before, glad you're here. We're in Colossians. We're in chapter two. So if you want to find that in your phone or in your Bible, uh, it'll be on the screen as well or in your notes. Uh, really encourage you to go there. Colossians two, eleven and following. We're gonna, it's a lot of scripture today, but we have a lot lot to talk about. And like I was just just uh, alluding to, lots been going on about life in my life. I guess it's last week. Lots of different things, and I've been just asking the question as we've been, you know, preparing for this: is what what do you really need in life? What do I really need? I mean, what do I what do I want to have in my life to live on? What is the absolute necessities of life? You know, what's worth spending my time, my money, my gifts, my talents on? What? How should I be doing that? You know, what steers my ship, floats my boat? Parks my car, pitches my tent. Okay, enough of that. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, I just thought that was kind of cute. But anyway, uh, so what is going to make my life complete? You know, what what is the fuel for me in my life to to be, to do, that gives me purpose, that makes it complete? And I would submit to you today. We understand through the title of the whole series and what we've seen in the bumper already that that Christ is overall. Jesus is overall. And this specific message we're titling "Jesus is sufficient." Jesus is sufficient because when I ask those questions, if I'm going to be perfectly honest, you know, is Jesus really sufficient for me in my life? Can, can you be honest with yourself about that? Is, is G, Jesus really all you need? We sing about it. We just sang about it, you know, about this, this lady wrote the song, take my life and, you know, let it be consecrated, Lord, thee, all my life toward you. But yet, you know, I, I, I like stuff. I don't know about you. I like new things. I'm wearing a semi-new t-shirt, which I really enjoyed putting on today because it just felt good. You know, it just felt good. There was something about that, right? Crawling into bed and and we've changed the sheets and they're freshly out of the the dryer. You know what I'm talking about? They're even still warm. That's something pretty good. I mean, if you're you're paying attention, right? It's really nice on a 105 degree day to get into your car and the air conditioning's working. All right, Are are you with me? So we have a lot of wonderful things, you know, that we enjoy, we we would say, you know, is that something I need? Is that something that I would really place value then in my life? And what would I do then to, to get there? Am I willing to turn everything over? What am I serving? Who am I serving? You know, what are these, all these questions. Well, what Scripture is telling us today is that Jesus really is sufficient for every part of life. Jesus is sufficient. And, and I know 
We live in a time in which, you know, we do have a lot of comforts. I mean, we really, really do. I mean, growing up, uh, you know, years ago, it's defined years ago, you know, we, you know, no electricity, no running water, all these kinds of things. I'm not trying to suppress us in any way or make us feel bad, but for us to understand in this day and time that really all I need in my life is to know the one who made me. That's really all I need when it gets down to it. And, and in this culture, it's so hard, I think, to realize. But that's what he is telling these folks 2,000 years ago. Because there were some people telling them, you needed more. You needed more than this Christ, this God-man who died on the cross for you. And so he's telling us that today. He's writing this letter for us. It is now contained in Scripture so that you and I can understand this, even in the context of our culture, that Jesus is sufficient. We're going to see real quick. I'm going to try to fly. Don't let me chase rabbits, okay? Just say, move on, all right, if you're tired of me, okay? Move on, and I'll keep moving on. Yeah, somebody already said it. There we go, okay? So, but four factors stating Christ's sufficiency, Okay? Four factors, real quick, it's a lot of text, and we're going to kind of move pretty quickly, okay, on it, but here's the first one. Jesus canceled the code. Jesus canceled the code. The, one of the first factors stating Christ's sufficiency. Let's look at the text, Colossians 2, 11 through 15. In Him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with a circumcision done by Christ. So we are circumcised, you see, in Jesus. And the Jews would have understood this to be a physical, you know, a sign of God's covenant. But Paul is saying Christ has circumcised our sin nature. So you and I, when we receive him, we are different now, okay? That's pretty important. Look at verse 12 having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. So we're now complete and alive in him, symbolized, symbolized by our baptism. He is not saying that baptism saved them. He's saying it is a symbol of that. We are coming with him in baptism. Verse 13, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. We talked about this at length last week, that we are forgiven. And there's not enough money or another human being in this world anywhere in any time that could have wiped out my debt okay, because of sin. Because of sin, my debt load was, is, is there, and Jesus Christ, the God-man, was the only one who could take care of that for me. I am now forgiven. Because we've all got a problem. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. Yeah, death. Death means that I am in trouble, that you are in trouble. We all are all going to, to die. And so what happens then if I die in my sin, if I am not forgiven? Hebrews 9, 27, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So we die, Scripture is saying, then comes judgment. Very, very interesting to think about if you're a deep thinker. If that is true, possibly, does, does, does God in his control of all of time mean then that when someone dies, he then goes to judgment as far as in a continuum, a time continuum that we would see? In other words, time didn't exist from the time that the person dies, he immediately then goes to judgment. Just something to think about, okay? I, I like to think about stuff like that. John 8, 21 says, then he said again to them, this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees. He said, I am going away and you will look for me and will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. 
He's telling them, listen, if you don't receive me, okay, you're going to die in your sin because where I'm going, you are not going to be able to get there. So Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. Jesus is the way. Revelation 20, 15, then if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, So if your name was not found written, if you don't know Jesus Christ, Scripture says you were thrown into the lake of fire. So I, I tell you, man, a lot of, I, I went to a, another rabbit hole this week, and I started reading about the lake of fire and what exactly that means. What I discovered, there's a thousand different you know, viewpoints of really what that means and what that is like, okay? There's a cessationist belief that says essentially, you know, people when they, be, if they don't know Christ, all right, when they're thrown into this place, their, their life is going to cease as we know it. They're just not going to exist anymore. But yet there are people that believe that they're going to live eternally there. What does the lake of fire look like? And, you know, and where is it at? And all these kinds of things. There, again, there's varying opinions all over the place. All I know is I don't want to be there. I don't want to be thrown into a lake of fire. I don't want any part of that, okay? And so that's what will happen if you die in your sin. I don't know, God led me to kind of go down that path, I think this week, just as a reminder, okay, not to be negative Ned, but we just simply need to be aware, right? Without Christ, listen, the most important thing is this morning is that you and I know Christ, that we have met him, okay? And because of that now, we are headed for eternity in heaven with him and not going to this very, very real place uh, called hell, okay? So we are now free from the law, the scripture says, because of him. And we couldn't live up to the rules that were established for right living. Jesus took care of that on the cross. He took the law, scripture says. He says, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. Okay, he took the law and nailed it there, making us forever free. Then notice victory now we experience in verse 15. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Okay, he defeated the enemy. Satan, he disarmed the powers and authorities. It's always available to us now to count on, to know that he has disarmed them. He's made it public for everyone to know. It wasn't anything in secret. We see it in Scripture. It was available and seen by everybody there when it happened. He's established victory for you and me. And we know what the final score is. We know the end of the game, when it ends, okay? But I'm even told through Christ, now I'm a winner. I now am victorious and I can bank on that and I can count on that. It's very, very important for me to know that. That I can win now. First Corinthians 15, 57 says, But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ canceled the code. Secondly, Jesus overcame legalism. He overcame legalism. We see this in, in verses uh, 16 and 17. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So we just talked about how Jesus canceled the code, the law. So as followers of Christ, we are now under grace and not the law. We're not under performance that I have to do these things or don't do all these things in order to gain this, this, this good relationship with God. That is not how it is done. For sin will have no dominion over you. Since you are not under law, we are now under grace. So we don't live under Jewish laws. Now the Colossians, some of them Jewish, okay, but most of them Gentile, there, there was a, kind of some bickering going on about this. 
Some of them thought you still had to live under the authority of the law, okay? And frankly, the Colossians, I'm sure, were upset about it. So that's why I think Paul is trying to straighten everybody out on this particular issue. This is why we don't judge one another for not practicing Jewish laws. Isn't the cross good enough, Paul was saying, okay, to finish the work of salvation? Do I need the law to finish the work of salvation? He was saying, no, Jesus Christ is sufficient. And so we can count on that. We can bank on that today. So I don't have to perform I don't have to do this or not do that, okay, to be right then before God, as many of them thought. Now, Paul's addressing diets and dates, that is, dates on a calendar, right? We see he's talking about foods being unclean and clean, and foods we know have been declared clean now, but don't judge someone, and I shouldn't still judge someone if they still abstain for dietary or spiritual reasons, or if they partake for the same reasons. So how about those very important religious observances in the Jewish system? Passover, Pentecost, Feast of Tabernacles, all these things. You know, the dates, right? The dates on the calendar, diets and dates. Well, Paul's saying these dates and observances aren't part of the church age. They had their purpose in preparing the Jewish nation for the coming Messiah. The Messiah has come and the law now has been fulfilled. And it doesn't mean we can't see Jesus, though, in the law, that we can't see God in the law or the holiness of God in the law. Actually, the law reveals the holiness of God. 1 Timothy 1.8, again, New Testament, we know that the law is good if a man uses it properly. So, I look at the law and I determine if this is right or wrong, you know, as God leads and we can see then, and it's a good guideline then for Christian living, for following Jesus Christ, but it's not about the performance. So why live then in the shadow or the law when we've got Jesus, Jesus Christ, the sweet sunshine, the, the, the great overcomer, the one who paid the penalty for my sin in my life. Man, we've got him. And so we don't need that anymore. Don't need the law. So what are some modern ways then as we think through this? that we might be judged or that we judge other followers inappropriately. Now, listen, I know we might be thinking, well, I don't do this or, you know, I, I, I try, and of course we try not to, try not to judge anyone. But as I've been thinking about this, there are, there's certainly a lot of ways when this occurs. And I know we were attending a worship service a few years ago in the city and, uh, and, uh, we, we were observing the Lord's Supper, and, and it was a Protestant church. It was very similar probably to our church. But they had a, when we were going up to take communion, they had a alcohol side and a non-alcohol side. Very interesting. I had never seen that before, ever, you know. And they had it labeled, right? Uh, and, uh, and so it was labeled there for you. And, and so, uh, I chose the alcohol. No, I'm just kidding. I, cho- I chose, chose, and I, I went back. No, I, I'm just kidding. I didn't do that. But, uh, no, uh, it, it just got me to thinking, you know, what, what is the purpose in this? What, what, what are they, what are they doing? Because essentially, you know, the, the wine or the juice, it's symbolic and symbolic of blood. And so, we would obviously assume they drank wine. Obviously, back they served wine. The Bible says they did. We know that. And so we would use an alternative maybe that didn't have alcohol so that other people that, that maybe it wouldn't have, would offend somebody, et cetera, you know, but they offered both, which is very, very interesting. But I'm not to then to cast judgment on someone if I'm anti-alcohol on whether or not they're going to actually serve that one. Do you see it? And for me, that, that's kind of a... It kind of stirs me a little bit because I'm, I'm big time against alcohol because I've seen the way it's affected our family historically, and uh, I'm just not a fan at all. I don't think it really, I mean, if it had a purpose, a medicinal purpose or something like that, fine, you know, but, you know, most of the time we have alternatives now, you know, and so uh, don't want to get into that, but so it's just a personal thing that I then have to work on myself. Do you see it? 
Same with even the bread, unleavened bread versus Ritz crackers, all right? Or whatever you're going to use to represent bread. Do you see it? You know, it's like it's, it's, it's symbolic. And so we must understand that we do our best in symbolism to represent, okay? But not to be judgmental then about necessary and getting specific about a certain maybe product that's, that's being, you know, given out. I think there are other New Testament interpretations that we really can get out of whack with. I think we can get just really worked up about that we would say that aren't like hills to die on theologically that we we'll see maybe they're grayer areas in Scripture. And, uh, and so as I was thinking about that, even toward dates, uh, one thing that's kind of popular these days and what we try to guard is Sunday. We believe Sunday is sacred because they met on the first day of the week. The, the church, the early church, met on the first day of the week. So we try to do what they did. It's the first day of the week, which is Sunday. And so it's what we do. It's what we've always done. And it's what we've studied. It's what we believe, right? But now we can now go to church on different days of the week, okay? And so, you know, again, that is just a difference. And it's like a, it's like a thing where I shouldn't judge that necessarily, right? To say, I know people's schedules are wacky. Some have to work, you know, on Sundays. And so it's great that they're able to maybe go to a worship service on Monday night or Friday night or, or some other day of the week. And, and so, again, something different but it's not something to, to get worked up about, right? Not something to, to argue about necessarily. And so as I think through that, again, what Jesus Christ has done on the cross and freeing me from the law is to say, I'm not bound by it anymore. That is not the, the goal is to perform, to obtain this. My goal, listen, as God fills me with his spirit is to live my life for him, being obedient to what he tells me and using the Holy Spirit to discern what the word of God is saying to me. Do you see it? It's, it's freeing. It really is. Not to know I have to you know, dot every I and cross every T. Okay, the next one, the third one I see is this. Jesus fulfilled revelation. Jesus Christ has fulfilled all of revelation. He is revelation. He is the Messiah. He is the Word. He is the, the truth. We don't need any more added to it. So look at Colossians 2, 18 and 19. We'll continue on. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen, and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He has lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. So evidently, some of these folks were gravitating to a, th a theology of obtaining additional knowledge. In other words, the, the, the cross and the word itself was not enough. They needed additional. In this case, claiming some sort of a special insight by visions through the worship of angels. Now, we talked about this a couple weeks ago a little bit. And this caused these folks to be a little bit arrogant. Okay, They got a little bit prideful because they thought they were doing something extra to gain a little bit more in their life than others that were around them that were part of the, the Christian community that maybe hadn't experienced that or hadn't done that. Have you ever met anybody like that? And don't point fingers, all right? You know, uh, don't, don't look across the room or whatever. No, it, you know, we might have met, I've met a few people like that that have uh, maybe experienced something that I haven't experienced, and, and they think maybe it has taken them to another level, okay? Another plane in their spiritual walk with God, and that, that you had to have that, you had to add that if you wanted to reach, again, that little, take that little bit more on, that little extra knowledge to help you become who you really needed to be. You know, uh, even if it didn't really even match up to what the Bible said. You know, re remember syncretism. We talked about syncretism a lot last week. It's a merging of religions and then adding something 
to, in addition to what the two religions or more are coming together to make a certain belief unique, maybe new or something different, something cool, all right? Something that I've experienced that maybe you need to, okay? And it's usually based on that additional experience, again, that has been added to Christianity. And so that's what we need to be careful of. We should always use, again, the Spirit of God and the gospel as a lens by which we determine what the Bible is telling us, okay? So it's not necessarily the experience of another individual. And listen, I'm, I'm talking experiences are great. My experience, your experience in coming to know Jesus was a very real thing. And the way that that happened to me was probably different than the way that it essentially happened to you. But I know what happened to me. You know what happened to you. As long as that was a time in which, you know, I repented and placed my trust in Christ, that's the commonality. But it's going to look a lot different, okay? You probably said some different words than what I said, okay? And that's cool. We know that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You might call in a different way, you know? And so simply our experiences are important, but we have to watch and understand and not let that become the center then of our theology if it doesn't match then what the Bible is telling us. True spiritual experiences with the Lord always lead, listen, to submission and to service. A true spiritual experience, they're always going to lead to submission. Listen, it shouldn't make me more proud. It should make me more humble. When I, when I really experience God and he's, he's working in my life, Listen, I shouldn't be arrogant or prideful about it. Listen, it should be make, make me really more submissive. And as a result, I should serve the body even more. I should serve, the, I should wash more feet. Do you understand what I'm saying? I should, I should be willing to do that. Because again, that is a, a result when I experience God a little more. It means I'm, I'm giving up even more, I, I believe. So Jesus is the fulfilled revelation. He, we don't need any more revelation. Don't need any extra knowledge, okay? It is all right here. And everything then that, that I am that's coming in to me, I didn't again filter through the Holy Spirit, right? And through the lens of the gospel, which we obviously see in his word, okay? Uh, lastly then, Jesus trumps asceticism. Jesus trumps asceticism. And you might say, what in the world is asceticism? Okay. This is what it is. It's again, trying to reach another spiritual state, a higher level. Okay. By doing it in a certain way, kind of a funky way. Okay. By extreme, extreme self-discipline, by extreme self-denial, things like that. We'll see that in the scriptures we read verses 20 through 23. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. They're really not going to help on the inside eventually. That is, I think, it's again, it's an outward trying way to please God when you and I need a transformation on the inside. Utilizing convictions and methods of humans to obtain holiness is not acceptable. Self-neglect, self-denial, self-infliction driven by pagan religious practices cannot produce holiness before God. So the picture I see is folks not eating properly or fasting excessively, maybe separating themselves from any remote possibility they're trying to, okay, of committing personal sin and even removing themselves completely from the world. So it'd be like 
you know, not eating, not drinking for large amounts of time, fasting just too much to where you're just almost hurt. You're hurting yourself. You're, and you're proving to God that your body isn't worth it. I don't care enough about me. I'm just, I'm just giving up everything, right? And even to the point of neglect of the world to say, I don't care about you anymore. All I care is about me. So in order to keep away from sin or from the world, I'm going to remove myself socially. I'm going to remove myself from society. In other words, I'm going to go find a cave somewhere and live it and dwell in it, okay? Hurting my body, hurting myself, hurting all my relationships. Why? Because I think by doing that, it's performance to make myself look good before God. Do you see it? And that's, that's paganism, man. It's stuff inflicted by people with a wrong viewpoint. Let's look at John 17, okay? This is Jesus' prayer to God, okay, in the garden on behalf of his disciples. He says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. And as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. So I am to not, and what we often do is we try to separate ourselves, we think, from the world, thinking that is the best thing to do when Jesus' prayer was that we would be sent into the world to influence the world. Do you see it? And this is a very, very tough thing because so many people have a viewpoint these days that we need to withdraw and get away from culture. And to, to a certain extent, I, I would say, yeah, in some instances, I guess, but no, we need to go where people are are where they're lost. And I, I need to focus on this. I think the idea is that Jesus wants us to be insulated, insulated from the world, okay? Not isolated from the world. Do you see the difference? I'm insulated and penetrating the world. I'm ready because I'm sanctified by the truth. I'm not isolated, separating myself, saying that I don't want to be in the game. Listen, growing up, man, I was, I was a very average basketball player, if that. And I rode the bench, man, especially in middle school. And uh, my daddy always told me, son, if you want to get in the game, go sit by the coach. Okay, I don't know if you were ever told that. He said, quit sitting on the end of the bench. He said, go and sit by the coach so he knows that you're there, you know. He, he was telling me all this stuff I never did. You know, poke your coach, all right? To tell him, hey, I'm Brett and I want to play. You know, I mean, he was just saying all this stuff. He said, you just got to let him know that you care, that you want to get in the game, right? Because I wanted to get in the game. Here's the deal. Listen about God, about the Christian life. You are in the game, we are in the game. I can choose to be in the game. I, the coach has already said, get in there, son. Get in there. Get in the game. But you and I, oftentimes, man, we are hesitant. We don't want to get in the game. Maybe we don't feel like we're adequate. Maybe we're holding on to something. Maybe we're saying Jesus isn't sufficient in any of these areas, right? Or some of the areas that we sang about, you know, take my heart, take my voice, take my lips, take it all. It's consecrated to you. He's saying, give it to me. Get in the game, man. Do that. Man, Top Gun, I don't know if you're a Top Gun fan, but, you know, recently, the, the old Top Gun movie, Mav, you know, you remember he went through all the stuff he did, his, his best buddy Goose died and all that stuff, and so at the end of the movie, you know, he's getting into it, and, and you know, he's, he's trying to do the right thing. He was all messed up, and they're crying out on their, their uh, you know, on their communication, they're saying, hey, get in the, get in the game. You got to get in the game, right, Mav? Get in the game. And he just was scared or whatever. He had all these feelings. And finally, man, he got in the game. Same thing happened in, in the second one, right? With, with uh, uh, what was his name? Is it Rooster? Is it Rooster? Yeah, Rooster, who was Goose's son. Same thing happened to him. It's kind of the same storyline. As they've got this mission, right? And man, he didn't get, he wasn't getting in the game. They're get in the game. Get in this. Engage. Get started. Listen, that's what the Spirit of God, I truly believe, is telling us today. 
We've got to get engaged. We've got to get in the game. He's telling us, he's giving us the freedom to get in. And I don't know about you, man. I didn't like sitting on the bench. You like sitting on the bench? Who wants to sit on the bench, man? I want to play. Man, what would you do if you got to the track, you know, or got to your cross-country meet? Man, Ian, dude, you sit this one out. Yeah, yeah, you'd be, yeah, you'd be fired up, man. What do you think? How do you think the Holy Spirit feels? When we, he's wanting us to engage and get out in the world because we are insulated, saturated with the truth growing in him, right? So that we can go out and affect people. That's what we're talking about here. That's what he's saying. He said, we need to understand it. It is this asceticism doesn't work. The self-denial, this, this self-infliction, self-pain, self-get away from everything, right? No, you need to be in it, need to be involved and get involved in what's going on. Romans 8, 37 says, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. That's a great promise, isn't it? For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Listen, the reason why we might be overcome is we're trying other things. We're thinking of these other compartments in our life. We're saying Jesus isn't sufficient. I need these other things in my life. And if I would just do these other things, then everything would be okay. We take a lot of things to the extreme. First Timothy 4 8, physical training is of some value, it says, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. We need to be all about, listen, saying Jesus is the answer, Jesus is sufficient in every area of my life. And I don't need something else to add to that. Jesus is the only way to holiness. Holiness is the goal of every disciple. What is holiness? Holiness simply is the pursuit of God and His ways. Just real quickly, i got to share this because this is from this morning in, in Oswald because this got me kind of just thinking, and I've been thinking a lot about all of this this week, but just what is sanctification? You know, what is growing in Christ? What, what exactly is that? And it just so happened that today was the day. Title of the, of the devotion is sanctification. Imagine that, right? Sanctification is an impartation, not an imitation. Sanctification is an impartation. Impartation is something that has been granted or given, given over to, okay? So, what this is telling me, and again, this isn't scripture, this is his comments, uh, you know, on, on, uh, on sanctification. He's saying, Jesus has imparted himself on us. We have been granted Jesus. I received Christ when he, he came and sought me. He came to seek and save the lost, right? And so he sought me out, and I said yes to him. And he imparted himself on me or in me, so to speak, okay? Imitation is on a different line. The Bible does say to imitate God, and Paul wrote, imitate me. So imitation is good, but the question is, is have I really been imparted? Imitation is good if you've been imparted. If you've received Jesus, not questioning anybody today, but it's something for us to think about. Have I surrendered to Jesus? Have I given over everything in my life? Would I say, He really is sufficient? He's sufficient. Or am I trying to do other things to fulfill that need that I haven't given over to Jesus? Do you see it? I mean, that's what we're, that's what we're talking about here. And it's fine if I imitate, it's the act of saying, you know, hey, I want to, to run like Ian, so I'm going to take his style, and I'm going to do things like, Paul was saying, there's not, obviously nothing lot, lot wrong with that. Paul was, was the epitome of following Jesus, and we're told to imitate God, but listen, I could be imitating someone and be the biggest phony in the room. Are you with me? The impartation is the most important. If I receive Jesus, is Jesus in me? 
And now because of that, filled with the Spirit, and am I letting the Spirit work in me to take every little aspect of me so that I, I would realize Jesus really is sufficient? Is Jesus really sufficient for me today? Is He really all I need today? Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my life. Take everything and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Is that my prayer today? Maybe God is leading you today to, to do that in some way. Maybe you've never received Christ. That's the first step in just knowing that you know Christ. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, Scripture says you will be saved. When that occurs, Scripture says we are filled in with the Spirit. We've got the Spirit of God. And that the Word, okay, is, is going to drive us as we take it in. And it's going to cause us then in continual surrender to bring us to the point of sufficiency in Jesus. And that's what He is calling us, church, at, to do today. It's what He's calling me, calling you to do today. God, we're so grateful for Your love, for Your grace today. Thank You for all You're doing. We thank You for Your Word, which is changing us, hopefully driving us to change. And I pray, God, that we will give in today, that today be the day. We're just taking another step, another step of obedience to follow You. So we thank You for the sufficiency of Jesus. We don't have to add anything to that. What you did on the cross was, was ample. We thank you for that. Break us, break our will so that we will surrender to you. That's our heart's desire. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. What is God calling you to do today? Let's be obedient. As we stand, let's be obedient.